I was not aware that uh, there was someone inside. On the 23rd of November 2014, a Virgin 737 was in final stages of preparations for takeoff. On my walk around, I found a door open that was closed before. I had a look inside, I couldn't see anything in there. Um, so I closed it up. What Paul Ovechkin didn't realise when he closed it up was his supervisor was still inside. There is a chance you can survive in the holds, but it's probably a journey you don't want to be taking. It was dark and the supervisor rushed to the door and called out for help. We heard a, um, a banging on the door and um, once we opened it up, he climbed out. Oh, it was just super apologetic. Obviously, it was a mistake. It's always quite a rush to get the plane out on time. Uh, we always have to follow um, certain timelines to get it out. It was just the lack of time and um, lack of, um, I suppose, resources to actually complete the job at times. An internal AeroCare record of the incident shows the company did speak to Paul Ovechkin about the dangers of the situation and the need to be very careful when closing up an aircraft. But then Paul Ovechkin says the company told him that there was no need for him to lodge an incident report, that someone else would take care of it for him. It's usually definitely the procedure to um, fill out an incident report, but at that time um, it wasn't up to me. When I first heard of the alleged incident of the person locked in the hole, I, I was quite shocked actually. Ron Barch is the former head of regulatory compliance and safety for Qantas. Certainly uh, if someone is uh, inadvertently locked in the hull of an aircraft, that is a very serious incident and something which would be reportable to the relevant authorities. Virgin Airlines and AeroCare said that they did investigate the matter internally and found that the supervisor was momentarily locked inside the cargo hold but that he'd got himself out. They also said that the plane would not have taken off until the worker was found. And so they concluded that closing the worker inside the cargo hold of a 737 was not a reportable incident to the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. The ABC has confirmed that the Australian Transport Safety Bureau advised Virgin Airlines that it was not a reportable matter. Ron Barch strongly disagrees. The fact that that could actually happen in... Uh, uh, within Australia is, um, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, concerning. The reporting culture is very much one of you would tell your supervisor something that happened, a near miss for instance, and your supervisor would very disconcerningly say, well, put a report in if you want. Jason Pugh, seen here, worked for AeroCare for two years before quitting in August last year. He makes the extraordinary claim that paperwork used by AeroCare workers to document important information such as the amount of cargo loaded on the plane and the names of people that conducted safety checks were regularly doctored by some ground crew to meet safety standards. For example, if bag numbers loaded onto the plane didn't match the number of bags checked in, they'd fudge the paperwork to ensure the numbers were within acceptable limits to allow the pilots to take off. So every flight that we did had something called a flight folder which was a bunch of paperwork which went to the airline and you know the airport and uh aerocare for all of them to keep records and i would say about 50 percent of them were doctored aerocare deny altering official paperwork which is subject to regular safety audits last year the company says it passed 180 audits some of them site inspections but some workers say when the scrutiny of audits is over the operation reverts to being chronically understaffed my name's got to offer 10 cans jason Pugh gave us this video of a former aerocare worker who doesn't want to be named the day he filmed these luggage containers, he says he unloaded more than 15 tonnes of bags by himself. Just me, one man. AeroCare responded that its rosters satisfy all safety regulations. But to put 15 tonnes into perspective, safety experts say that most baggage handlers would lift 
up towards two tonnes each day. Associate Professor Jeff Dell has worked in aviation safety for 30 years. He says mixing heavy lifting with the fatigue that comes with split shifts that can sometimes be spread over 12 to 15 hours makes for a more dangerous workplace. The actual risk exposure to the individual um, goes up um, significantly and, and so their potential for injury towards the, you know, the back end of that second shift is, is quite high. But AeroCare says it has the highest global safety accreditation and has won numerous safety awards, all whilst maintaining a low-cost mindset. That can't be done with a low-cost mindset. Mr Pugh claims that AeroCare pressured injured employees to return to work before they'd fully recovered to reduce the hours that the company had to report as lost to injuries. They're making it very difficult for me to actually uh, do the things I needed to do to recover uh, with my shoulder injury. So I, you know, the physio and the doctor said that I should be going to the gym to do exercises six days a week. But AeroCare was giving me split shifts three to five days a week where I was, you know, 12, 15 hours at the airport. So I couldn't even get to the gym. Mr Pugh says that AeroCare's injury reality on the ground was very different to that reflected in insurance premiums. There's constantly boys going down with work cover injuries. They were constantly pushing the boys too hard. AeroCare denies it has high injury rates. It says it has had no safety breaches in 25 years and that its workers' compensation insurance premiums are up to 30% less than industry norms and it has fewer serious injury claims than competitors. But there have been accidents. This blood-stained truck shows the aftermath of a terrible accident in which a Sydney AeroCare worker's toe was sliced off. 7.30 understands that in the last two years, at Sydney International alone, AeroCare's ground workforce, which numbers 324 people, made in excess of 130 injury reports. Safety experts say that equates to a total injury frequency rate, which is too high. If that data is correct, then, then that is extremely high and would warrant further investigation. Last month, 7.30 revealed claims that instead of going home between split shifts, AeroCare workers had been making their beds at the airport to sleep in squalid conditions, sparking fears that our planes are being serviced by a workforce that is dangerously fatigued. AeroCare workers are paid at a rate below the poverty line, forced to work split shifts, often spending 15 hours a day at the airport but receiving as little as seven or eight hours pay. The point is this, they are employed under an enterprise agreement that has been negotiated between the employer and the employees. They have agreed on the terms and conditions. AeroCare has consistently denied invitations for an interview. After investigating, the company claims that makeshift sleeping camps at airports, as seen in this video, are without foundation. However, it has provided no evidence to back its claim. The company also says, and 7.30 accepts, this worker sleeping in a luggage container was not an AeroCare employee and therefore didn't represent the behaviour of its employees. We end up sleeping underneath the terminal where all the baggage goes in between just to, just to catch up on sleep. The company dismissed the claims made in 7.30's first story by George Osaris. I will lose my job. AeroCare stated that Mr Osaris only did 28 shifts and hadn't worked for nine months. It said it was unreasonable to suggest he'd risked his job by speaking against the company. But Mr Osaris maintains he was, nonetheless, on the books and showed 7.30 his current AeroCare security identification card and uniform. Two days after his interview, Mr Osaris was asked to return his security card on the grounds that he was no longer employed by AeroCare but more people and more claims have emerged. Their attitude towards safety was great, but that was their attitude. What actually happened was not as great. There was a lot of instances where it does come back to fatigue also. Chris Wyatt worked for AeroCare in Brisbane for two years, finishing up last year. He says he and others regularly slept at the airport between split shifts. 
there's not a lot of other options to uh, consider. There's, oh well, you there were a lot of times where people were sleeping on different things. We had people sleeping on barrows, and that was just because purely fatigue. It was uncomfortable. People were just too tired to continue going. He claims fatigue and dehydration were contributing factors in his hospitalisation midway through a shift on the 2nd of December 2014. There was a time where I was that dehydrated and that fatigued that I just wasn't getting that my body was telling me I was that dehydrated that I ended up having to go to hospital. Mr Wyatt says he had to leave his shift early and call an ambulance. However, Eric here say there is no record of the incident occurring. But 7.30 has obtained the triple zero call from the staff car park. Ambulance, what of the town or for where of your emergency? Uh, Brisbane Airport. So what's your symptoms there, sir? Okay, um, I'm kind of losing blood in both my arms and legs. Uh, if I stand up, I'll pass out. Either the organisation is impeccably good or not all the incidents are necessarily being reported. Earlier this week, 83% of AeroCare workers approved a new enterprise agreement put forward by the company. The company says the vote is a strong endorsement of improved wage conditions, such as a 5% pay increase and other benefits. However, split shifts remain. Employees will have no weekly guarantee of work and will only be assured of 60 hours a month. Former workers like Jason Pugh believe the conditions and pay rates remain substandard and potentially dangerous for the flying public. The whole industry will get a lot less safer. It'll get a lot more dangerous if AeroCare get away with this sort of stuff. If the general safety level of AeroCare spreads across the industry, then it's highly likely an aircraft will go down one day because of it.